Magical Girl Sight is the latest in a long line of New Wave Magical Girl shows designed to show the world that hope is futile and that everything happy will someday die. It's the definition of adolescent torture porn, so as anybody who's ever heard me talk about King's Game should be able to guess, I love it. Unfortunately, my bountiful and unironic affection for the series isn't enough to save it from its overflowing chamber pot of narrative flaws, so I'm gonna have to put my affection aside, strap the thing to the surgery table, and take it apart bit by bit until I can figure out why it's not ticking. Despite being so dark that it can't see its hand in front of its knife, Magical Girl Sight fails at one of the most basic and important elements of storytelling, that being creating a believable and sympathetic protagonist. For all of its efforts to make us want to squeeze Asagiri tight so that the bad man, bad girl, bad girl, bad girl, bad man, bad girl man can't hurt her anymore, the only thing that it accomplishes is giving us a crying teenager to ogle at while shoving popcorn in our various orifices. And I am totally down for that, but it doesn't exactly constitute what one would call good writing. But but what is it about Asagiri that makes her so difficult to sympathize with, especially when, on a surface level, she ticks all the boxes? Asagiri is precious. She's cute and small and quiet with a nice smile, wouldn't hurt a fly if it had a heart-shaped gun to her head. On top of that, her life sucks hard and only arguably gets any better as the series goes on. Why isn't every overweight nerd with a katana lining up to kill her brother and take her hand in holy waifu moni? Short answer, the suffering is overdone, but any 2-bit anti-tube hack with an Amazon Prime account could tell you that. Long answer, it's overdone, but there are a few different ways in which it's overdone, some of which are less obvious than others, so let's start from the obvious and work our way down. The time to rape index on Magical Girl site is 13 minutes and 21 seconds, and that's only one of the life-ruiningly horrible things that happened to Asagiri before the end of the first episode. Going down the list, we have domestic abuse, bullying, head shoved in toilet, attempted mutilation, successful mutilation, committing manslaughter, attempted suicide, dead cat, glue butt, bleeding from the eyes, this thing, and world's edgiest shoes. By all rights, she is the poorest, most unfortunate of souls, and if she were a real person, you'd have to be some kind of screwed up not to think she's deserving of at least a few bad feels. But that's just it. She's not a real person. The barrage of misfortune that befalls her isn't the result of the world not being as it should. It's the conscious decision of a single screwed up mangaka and the anime studio that brought it to life. Seeing all this terrible shit happen to her doesn't make us think, fko dane, fko dane. It makes us think, damn, this guy's fucked up. Because it lets the viewers see exactly what the writer was thinking when designing Asagiri's backstory. It's like he goes up to his editor and says, hey, I've got this protagonist for my new Madoka, and I don't know how to make her sympathetic, what do? And the editor's like, well, kids are all about getting bullied these days, so that's a must. Have her get bullied to the point of suicide, or have a bad family situation. If you want to go really angsty, you could have her accidentally kill someone someone, or have her pet die, or you could rape her, but that's a bit- THANKS! <laughs> It's just too much, and the result is an inelegant parody of real suffering rather than a character we can actually feel sorry for. Compare this to Madoka, the pinnacle and popularizer of the dark magical girl genre. Madoka is famous for its brutality, to the point where even the cute merchandise featuring chibi versions of its characters is, oh no, why would you do that? But while the suffering in Madoka is significantly less realistic than that in Magical Girl's sight, it lands in a way that Asagiri's various torments couldn't even hope for. No Nobody in real life has to worry about turning into a homicidal two-and-a-half-dimensional paper cutout of a Victorian orchestra conductor because their newly uncrippled love interest falls for the green-haired third wheel since they were too self-conscious about being a zombie to nab the dick that they traded their soul for. Even so, we feel for Sayaka Miki. We make memes about Sayaka Miki. And that's because even if the outcome of her struggle is fantastic, the struggle itself is familiar. She gives too much of herself for the sake of pleasing a love interest who gives gives nothing in return. She falls for the outlandish promises of a manipulator wanting to use her for his own ends. She makes mistakes. Very human mistakes. And that's the first thing that makes the suffering in Madoka more impactful than it is in Magical Girl Sight. Why is Asagiri's life the way that it is? Not because fluffy extra-dimensional John Stuart Mill offered her a Faustian power bargain gone wrong, it's just plain bad luck. She was born with an older brother who relieves stress by punching her in the ovaries. Her home abuse makes her 
timid, which leads to Serena's group killing her cat and orchestrating a rape for kicks. That bullying makes the site administrators say, Go, Danny, and give her a magic stick. You know, a stick? This is what sticks look like. The key here is that none of this is her fault. It just happened to her, which leaves the audience in one of two camps. Either you share experiences with Asagiri, in which case you likely have bigger problems with this show's disgustingly exploitative use of rape slash bullying slash domestic abuse, etc. as a vehicle for cheap sympathy, or you don't share experiences with Asagiri, in which case your emotions just go, well, poor thing, glad that's not me. With Sayaka, and with pretty much any other character in Madoka, we see her fall into despair as a result of her own choices. She starts as a normal, happy high school girl, and then she decides to become a magic high school girl, which causes her to lose her soul and makes her unwilling to go after Kyosuke. She wishes for Kyosuke's health, which is what allows him to go back to school and get together with... I want to say Harumi? The third one. She kills familiars before they can turn into witches and doesn't accept grief seeds from Kyoko and Homura, so her soul gem corrupts and she becomes a witch. Look at this last conversation between her and Kyoko in episode 8. Sony Vegas decided to give me a hard time and wasn't letting me put the clip in the video, so I improvised a little bit. Um... Enjoy this. Balance means good and bad have to zero themselves out, right? That's what you said, or something like it. I think I understand what you mean now. The good thing is, I did save a few people. But the bad thing is, I got angrier, and my heart filled up with envy and hate. It got so bad, I even hurt my best friend. Sayaka, you saw Jim. For all the happiness you wish for someone, someone else gets cursed with equal misery. That's how it works for magical girls, and that's how it is for me. I was stupid. So stupid. Sayaka! Sayaka's last words before turning into a witch are an admission of her own culpability. I was stupid. So stupid. Not fuck Kyubei, not fuck Kyosuke, not fuck the other one. I was stupid. I made a mistake. None of Sayaka's suffering happens randomly, and the viewer can draw a direct line of causation from Sayaka's wish to every bad thing that happens to her over the series. We can do the same thing with Kyoko, wishing for the success of her father's church and losing her whole family as a result. We can do the same thing with Hamiru, going back in time over and over again to keep Maduka from becoming Maguka, only to make her the center of karmic destiny and the most powerful witch of all time as a result. And that makes all of their trials so much more engaging than Asagiri's because we can't shove them aside by saying Sayaka and Homura and Kyoko are unfortunate in ways that we are not. We make choices every second of our lives, and some of those choices can have far-reaching and disastrous consequences that we can't even begin to predict. By the time a person is 12 or so, they know if they're going to be Asagiri or not. You can live a perfect life for 85 years, make one stupid move, and turn into Sayaka to Tomorrow. Equally important is the fact that Madoka shows us the descent from smiley normal high school girls to frowny magic high school girls. Back when I was getting my bachelor's, I had a professor tell me that one of the most important parts of story crafting is something he called establishing the normal world. If you want the inciting incident of your story to be impactful, it's vital that the viewer is able to see how that incident changes the story's world. Look at the first non-flashback scene in Madoka, which is like a minute long so I can't really show it, but imagine it and you're thinking brain. The series jumps from giving us a vision of the world in peril to showing us the things that Madoka wants to keep safe. Her house, her dad, her brother, her mom, happy breakfast, talking about boys, running to school with toast in her mouth. Minutes later, we see her friends, Sayaka and... Tsubomi? The other one. All of the things that Madoka stands to lose in the upcoming conflict. We see her go from this to this as she watches her friends fall into darkness and suffer and die, and we care whether or not Madoka is able to save the world, because in Madoka Magica, the world is worth saving. Look at Asagiri now. Same deal with Sony Vegas, except this time, it's a hoedown. Asagiri goes down to the railroad track, looking all sad cause she's dressed in black. Takes one step forward, then two steps back, 
track cause she can't bring herself to get hit by a train It sits on the ground and everyone around seems tired of this little emo hussy feeling down So they all walk away while she sits there and frowns and says Every day all I can think about is dying And that's the scene Asagiri's first non-flash-forward line in the whole series is Every day, all I can think about is dying. And following that pattern, she starts the show with a damn suicide attempt. Why should we care if Asagiri's world gets turned upside down when her world is so bleak to begin with? Death would literally be a preferred outcome for her, which leaves us wondering why she's bothering to do anything that she's doing. The series does try to give us one answer to this question, that being Asagiri's relationship with the friend she makes as a result of her suffering. Pedro made a video a while back about why this aspect of the series is actually pretty well handled, and I agree with her for the most part, but from a structural standpoint, using Asagiri's friends as a means of showing that her life is worth saving is mishandled in so many ways. First off, what happens if Asagiri's friends die? If she loses Yatsumura and the others, she'll be emotionally devastated, hopeless, alone in the world, completely devoid of anyone who shows her even the smallest hint of kindness. In other words, exactly where she was before she met any of these people. What will she have learned? The world's not fair and she's gonna be miserable up until the day she finally jumps in front of a train? She already knew that. How will she have changed? Will she get sadder? How? She already tried to kill herself in the first episode. How much worse is it going to get and why do we care? Alternatively, her friends could all live and we could get a happy ending, but the problem then is the resulting disconnect between adversity and outcome. How has Asagiri changed and what did she do to earn it? The various sources of suffering in her life weren't things that she had to overcome in order to achieve this hypothetical level of happiness. In this scenario, she suffers and then she's happy and very little happens along the way to connect the two. The sources of hardship early in the series aren't something that she has to move past or defeat in order to gain friends, they just sort of happen, because the writers know that the series needs a point to which we can compare Asagiri's current happiness so that we can theoretically appreciate it more. Likewise, Asagiri isn't a fundamentally different person as a result of her hardships or of interacting with her friends. She attempts to stand up for herself a few times, like when she tries to take everyone's magic sticks, this is what a stick looks like by the way, and fight the administrators on her own, but ultimately she backs down at the first mention of friendship and being in this together. She's still meek and conflict averse, even when it comes to saving her friends' lives. It's just that now, instead of backing down from people she's scared of, she backs down from people that she likes. Compare this to Homura's journey in Madoka. During episode 11, Ten. which I firmly believe is one of the best episodes of anime of all time, Homura is literally unrecognizable. She's timid and weak, horrible at everything, cute as a button, and borderline suicidal. In other words, a watered-down Asagiri. But, as we see her go back in time again and again, always trying and failing to keep Madoka safe, we see that timidity, that hope, slowly get chipped away and replaced with cold, determined purpose. By the end of episode 11 Ten. slash beginning of episode 1, Homura is a new person, and more important than that, she's a new person as a direct result of the suffering that she endures. Seeing Madoka die time and time again slowly kills her optimism to the point where at one point she fantasizes about the two of them becoming witches and destroying the worthless world together. Like Homura, we see Asagiri when she's miserable and we see her when she's doing pretty alright, and like Asagiri, we we see Homura when she's happy and weak and ignorant, and we see her when she's strong and frightening and fierce. The reason Homura's transformation is so much more impactful than Asagiri's is that we watch Homura's transition happen as a result of her own conscious choices. Lastly, where is the hope in Magical Girl Sight? Where, ultimately, is the viewer expecting Asagiri to end up at the end of the series? Assuming the best possible outcome, Asagiri and Yatsumura get together and live happily ever two years. Two years. Less, maybe? Maybe a little more? The very nature of being a magical girl in Magical Girl sight suggests that a quote-unquote good ending just isn't possible for these characters. Even if they defeat the administrators and kill the bullies and stop the Tempest and resurrect Asagiri's cat from the dead, what do they get to enjoy? They've each used up half of their magic life support tattoos by the end of the first season. They get a few years of lightly censored lesbian subtext before their fragile magic 
magic meat sacks peter out? And this is the best case scenario. As opposed to Madoka, where the best case scenario is literally becoming god and engaging in lightly censored lesbian subtext while naked in space. But on a smaller scale, each of the characters in Madoka has something reasonable that they can hope for and achieve if things go their way. Sayaka wants Kyosuke, Homura wants Madoka's safety, Madoka just wants everyone to get along, and even Kyubei wants to save the damn universe. Each of these things is something that can happen and which would constitute a happy ending. Knowing that these things are at risk whenever the girls and cat thing face opposition makes the viewer care about what happens. If the whole gang dies in Magical Girl's sight, well, I mean, they were gonna do that anyway. Tempest happens and the world gets destroyed? Who cares? That world sucks! In order for us to care about any of the conflicts that the various characters in Magical Girl's sight are facing, we have to know that they have something worth fighting for that makes us really care if they lose. Madoka might be famous for its darkness, but darkness has no impact without light. It's the little things in Madoka that make us want the world to be saved. Madoka's dad playing with Tatsuya in the storm shelter. Hitomi freaking out thinking that Madoka and Sayaka are a couple. Madoka's teacher ranting about eggs. All these little, funny, charming moments that make us want to see the world saved. When describing what magical girls are, Kyubei says that they bring hope to the world, and the series ends with Madoka becoming the personification of hope itself. That's what's missing from Magical Girl Sight. A reason to care. A reason to believe that the world can get better. We have just as much darkness, just as much tragedy, just as many cute girls in unfortunate situations. What we don't have is a reason to give a shit if any of them make it out alive, let alone if they wind up happy or fulfilled, if they achieve their goals, if they save the world. None of that's important because the world in Magical Girl Sight isn't worth saving. There's no light, no hope, no sitting around a dinner table chatting about boys and watching Asagiri's brother drop cherry tomatoes on the floor. In Madoka, the characters grow, and as they go through their trials, every hardship they face cements the idea in the viewer's mind that these girls have something to fight for. That they have lives that they want to protect and goals that they want to achieve. That hope matters. That this world is worth it. Today's lucky patron is... What is that? Oh my god, is that the cypher beat for this year? Wow. Uh, alright, guess I can work with this. As much as I would love to do my usual spiel and have an entertaining view retaining YouTube credit reel, I guess I can postpone a proper Patreon promotion and tell you all the story of this anti-tube explosion. Just one year that I've been playing this game and there's 120,000 people screaming out my username. No way you can doubt I'll be the best of all time. Gonna be the king of anti-tube like I'm the king of rhyme. Crazy social power since my very first upload. Took a girl named Lachlan and renamed her Patreon. All you other anti-tubers can't step to me. YT18's OGEP! Time for me to throw shade, but I don't really know what to do. I only upload once a month, and then I still grow more than you. Got a list of disses for this, but let me tell you what's true. Why cut you down when oh my wa mo shin I might be mid-tier now, but soon I'll leave you all in the dark. Gonna punctuate your existence with a diacritical mark. Not one anti-tuber on YouTube has that explanation point snark. Gonna make you all my bitches till you're saying fuck, fuck! Good job, buddy. Look, look. Oh, of course we'll go for walkies. Look, look. Uh, is this still going? Look. Am I still supposed to be rapping right now? Look, look. Cause that's all I got. <laughs> look. Anyway, today's lucky patron is Ready Paid. Congratulations and thank you for your support. And another big thank you to all of my other patrons. And I will say, just uploaded some exclusive side notes demos to Patreon if anybody's interested in that kind of thing. Thank you all for watching, I'm really happy with how this video turned out. And until next time, this has been Explanation Point, signing out.